What's up guys, Ryan Sprague here, and I'm just dropping in to remind you about our Patreon campaign. Somewhere in the Skies is always free to consume, but it's not free to create. So if you want to help the show on a monthly basis, we have tons of rewards for you in return, including shoutouts on the show and website, bonus content and episodes, and free merch. Want to be my guest or pick a topic for the show? You can do that too. So if you'd like to learn more and to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you, and keep looking up. Today on the show, author, researcher, and investigator for the Singular 14 Society, Tobias Wayland. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Tobias, welcome for the very first time to Somewhere in the Skies. Thank you so much uh, for, for having me. I'm a big fan and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't wait to be on. Well, thank you. And I know this has been a long time in the making. I was going to have you on when you came out with your first book, uh, The Lake Michigan Mothman. But we, uh, I'm so happy that now you have another book out. So we get to cover more than just The Mothman tonight, which <laughs> I might add, I wore this T-shirt specifically for you, man. And I've got my... Uh, <laughs> I've got my yeah. My chupacabras in the background too. I'm a UFO guy, man. So we're stepping out of my territory tonight a little bit, but I'm excited. I, I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this one because uh, you have been investigating all types of things. Like, you know, I'm a ufologist. You've got people who just look at Bigfoot or just hunt ghosts. But uh, over at the Singular 14 Society, you guys are doing everything. So um, I guess kind of my my first question for all first time guests is how did you get interested in all of this stuff? Like what first got you interested in the, the unexplained and in the 14, which is another question we'll get to, but um, yeah, man, where did this all start for you? Sure. You know, honestly, I like to tell people that if it hadn't been for uh, experiences that started in, in my early childhood, I probably would have been a, a relatively normal, if pretty nerdy guy, but you know, ever since I was a, a little kid, you know, I, I have had these experiences and I, I, I can't explain them. And uh, they, they, they sort of cross the, uh, the, the, the boundaries between phenomena. So they're, they're, they're not easily sort of uh, uh, pigeonholed into to one particular aspect of, of uh, strangeness. You know, I remember uh, some of my earliest memories, honestly, as a, a, a kid uh, are just being terrified to, to go to bed because I knew when I did that something was, was coming for me and, and, and it happened fairly regularly. I mean, and I'm talking as, as, as young as, you know, two or three years old, my earliest memories are of, you know, things uh, poking my, my sides while I'm in bed or the feeling of like hands trying to get underneath me to, to lift me up or having the, the covers pulled over my, my, my head in, in fright and, and seeing hands uh, pressing from the outside. Um, and, and of course, as, as I aged, uh, the, the, the experiences, um, while probably not more developed, certainly like my mind was more developed. And so my, my memories of the, the uh, events as they progressed are, are clearer. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it really in, involved a lot of nighttime visitation, uh, seeing shadow people, um, you know, uh, receiving weird messages, uh, uh, thing, things like that. And so, you know, I, I'm old enough that when I was a little kid, of course, like there wasn't any, any internet or anything. And so uh, I couldn't really turn to my, uh, my, my family, like they're, they're, they're great. They're, they're great people. But at that time, especially as, as a child, um, they weren't really prepared to deal with those experiences. And so they were largely written off as, uh, as, as a child's imagination. And then, you know, by the time I was, I was old enough, I think to have my, uh, my, my folks take me seriously. Um, you know, I was just dealing with it by myself. Um, and so what I did was I was a voracious reader and, and I would go to the library where I discovered books by, you know, people like, uh, uh Whitley Strieber and John Keel, 
uh, Brad Steiger, uh, you know, Lauren Coleman, guys like that. And, uh, and, and I would read about these experiences that, that other people were having. And uh, a lot of them were very similar to the experiences I was having. And so um, that helped honestly, just kind of knowing that, that there were, were other people out there uh, who were experiencing similar phenomena uh, really, really gave me some peace of mind. You know, I, I, I knew I, I wasn't crazy, if, if nothing else. And so, you know, when I was in my 20s then and I was kind of deciding what I wanted to do, um, you know, I, I, uh, I started volunteering as a, a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network. And hmm. uh, from there... Uh, I tried to kind of narrow down exactly what I wanted out of this and what I wanted to get back. And, and eventually what I, I landed on was I wanted to try to provide for people the, the same thing that those authors and, and a multitude of, of other authors since, you know, have, uh, have, have provided for me, you know, uh, engaging with, with witnesses, um, helping them try to understand their experience. If I can, I mean, we don't have a lot of answers or if I can't at least being a safe place that they can come to and, uh, and, and share those experiences, you know, um, that's not something that a lot of people have. Um, and I think just in, in the internet age, uh, that's, that's something that we're finally able to kind of provide for people on a, a more widespread basis. And so that was, kind of our thinking behind the Singular Fortean Society. You know, I, I met uh, my, my wife, Emily, in, in 2015. And of course, we hit it off uh, right away. And uh, sometime in 2016, we were kind of thinking about uh, different projects, like just creative projects. And, uh, and you know, my, my background in, in, in education is, uh, is, is writing and, and literature, and she has degrees in photography and uh, design. And so we were thinking, well, between the two of us, we should be able to come up with something. Right. And, uh, and so we came up with the singular 40 in society and, uh, and, and at the very least, I guess that was my motivation for, you know, behind my, my half of it. Awesome. Well, I got to ask was, uh, was your wife into all this stuff before? I know for me, you know, when I would go on first dates and the, the ufologist, thing would come up i would never <laughs> i would never get the second date to bias what was it like um when you first shared all this with emily was she had she had experiences as well or how did that all happen sure so you know i much like uh you you know i i reached a point in my life where i you know i i just wasn't happy uh dating women who weren't willing to accept that part of me because it is a really big part you know like and, and, and there's no denying it i can't ignore it um, and so I was very upfront about it uh, every time. Like it, it was like the first thing in my dating profile. So there, like there were no surprises. Uh, now for Emily, she had had experiences, but she wasn't really into the paranormal or or, or any aspect of it. You know, uh, prior to us us uh, meeting, I think that she had some uh, interest. You know, sort of a a, a casual you know, kind of, of interest, but, you know, she wasn't actively investigating or anything like that. Uh, most of her own experiences, she had just kind of written off as uh, some weird thing that who knows what it was, maybe it was a dream or hallucination or something. And, um, and yeah, it was really after we, we met that she became more involved and, and, you know, obviously now she is uh, in, investigating and, and uh, doing a, a lot of good work for the, the singing of the society. Right, right. And well, let's touch on that, Fortean. Now, I know a lot of my listeners will be familiar with what Fortean is, who Charles Fort is. But for those who don't know, Tobias, I'm sure you're used to this question. Um, can you kind of run us through Fort 101, the introductory course? Who was he? What did he do? And uh, why did you guys decide that that's really the approach and kind of the um, the inspiration for what you inevitably wanted to do with the with the society. Sure. So uh, Charles Fort was an early 20th century collector of weird news stories. And so essentially what he would do is he would um, collect all of these weird news stories from all over the world and he would put them together and he would write about them uh, in giant volumes like this, uh, which is, you know, a, a proud part of our uh, book collection, the collected works of Charles Fort. And he would write about all of these weird news stories 
And um, basically, he would sort of speculate, like very tongue in cheek, um, about what might be behind them and all of the, the commonalities between these seemingly disparate subjects. And uh, the, the fact is, they have a lot in common. And, uh, and he didn't ignore that. And so one of his most famous quotes is, one measures a circle beginning anywhere. And that is to say that uh, by examining uh, any part of the, the paranormal, you know, be it go uh, uh, ghosts or UFOs or cryptids, whatever, you can learn something about all of it because there are so many similarities that uh, it's, it's almost certainly connected in some way. Um, and, and, and what that uh, means specifically is, is unknown because nobody really knows enough about this stuff to really say for sure. Um, but yeah, he would, he would write all of this stuff and he would find all of these different weird commonalities and sort of speculate about what was all behind it. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, some of the, the authors that I, I grew up reading and a lot of them were inspired by, by Charles Fort. And so, you know, I started seeing his name uh, because of the the authors that, that I was reading. And I was like, well, I mean, obviously if he's inspiring these other people, then I, I need to know what he was about, you know? And, um, and yeah, his, his influence is, uh, is, is everywhere. His, honestly, uh, Charles Fort's influence on, uh, you know, modern day uh, uh, paranormal in investigation or ufology or just whatever, everything uh, that has to do with, with weirdness, it's sort of uh analogous to um like hp lovecraft's influence on on horror it's it's just everywhere um and so if you really want to understand like for instance like uh, john keel has seen something of a a resurgence i think uh recently in 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 popularity and people who are recognizing his work and stuff and and I submit you cannot understand John Keel if you haven't read Charles Fort because he was such a big influence. Um, and so that was kind of the, the impetus, I think, behind us wanting to uh, feature that, that Fortean mindset very, very prominently. Because I think the, the, the Fortean sort of, of philosophy is... Um, I don't want to say that it's 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 necessarily unbiased, I, but I think that what it might represent is sort of the uh, purest form of what people are trying to do in the paranormal today. You know, so if if you roll back uh, everybody who is popular now uh, and who is influential now, and you look at what their work is based off of, you're going to find Charles Fort almost every time. You know, that, that's that's Jacques Vallée. That's that's it's everybody. And so um, rather than, you know, sort of focus on one individual or, or one perspective or philosophy or something based off of Charles Fort, why not just go back to Fort and uh, and include everybody's perspective since then sort of under this uh, umbrella of Fortiana? Right. Yeah, I love umbrella is the perfect word, because I think, you know, a lot of us spend all our time, you know, for me entrenched in just UFOs and not looking at the other topics that could be intrinsically linked with that. But I'm not even bothering to look at the data or the evidence of that. So I think you're right. I think it's important to always know where we've been um, to see where we're going. And I mean, for it was that that pioneer for that really paved the way for everything that's come since then. So no, I'm, I'm, I completely agree with you on that. And, um, I, I guess to kind of rewind a little bit, um, let's go to Mothman. Now this is a topic I love and I've covered it a couple times on the show, whether it be with, uh, you know, Seth Breedlove or, um, several other John Tenney, I know talked about it a little bit on the show before, but I never really gone that far into it. And when I learned that, uh, Mothman had made a return possibly to the Midwest, I was, uh, oh man, I was so excited to hear about this. And you were one of the people who actually went out and investigated these mon modern day stories of Mothman. So um, let's go there. The Lake Michigan Mothman. This was uh, a book you came out previously, and I know it's going to be the uh, the subject of an upcoming 
documentary as well. Um, tell us a little about what prompted you to to write the book. What um, how how you kind of got involved with the whole Mothman investigation, if you don't mind. No, not at all. So uh, back in the spring of 2017, I had seen a trio of sighting reports that, that had come through the uh, uh, MUFON case management system, and they had published a, a short article. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information, but they were all sort of describing this weird flying creature that, that people were uh, reportedly seeing in the Chicago area. And like I said, there wasn't a lot of, of information to go on. So I thought, well, you know, I mean, MUFON published an, an article, you know, to their, their own site about it. Um, we'll see how it develops, but MUFON isn't uh, really forthcoming with information very often. Uh, so, you know, I, I honestly thought that it would just be like a, a one-off article. Our, our readers would enjoy it and we just never hear anything about it, you know, uh, ever again. And, and obviously that's not what happened. Um, so it wasn't too long after that, that I started seeing more reports uh, being shared. Um, and, and, and they were mostly coming from uh, Phantoms and Monsters. Uh, so Lon Strickler over at, at Phantoms and Monsters and uh, Manuel Navarrete at uh, UFO Clearinghouse. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to cover this journalistically, I'm going to need to reach out to these guys and uh, and see what's going on with this investigation and, and what's behind these reports. And so I, I had reached out to them both separately and was able to interview them in consecutive months that summer. So it was June and, and July. And, you know, I, I found them to be very friendly, uh, very, very forthright in uh, in terms of, you know, being willing to talk about the investigations and sort of what they, they had done uh, to, to look into these sightings. Um, you know, there were a lot of... Uh, 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 hypotheses being thrown around at that time. Um, but I, I found that neither uh, uh, Lon or Manuel really had a set um, sort of, uh, you know, pet theory or something that, that, that they were trying to wedge these sightings into. And so I was impressed by that. And it wasn't too long after that because these sightings <laughs> kept coming in, kept coming in. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, our proximity to that area was, was noticed and, and we had some, uh, some, some mutual, uh, acquaintances. And so, um, you know, Emily and I were asked to join this investigation, which was great because it didn't take very long for the singular 40 in society to start getting, uh, our, our own, uh, citing reports from, from witnesses. So, you know, it, it really, snowballed throughout 2017 um, and into 2018 and really began tapering off since then. And I don't know that it's ever going to, to completely disappear. We still get reports, honestly. Um, but uh, that, that sort of furor from 2017 has, has certainly died down considerably. Which is interesting because we do see these things go in waves. I mean, look at the first wave and Point Pleasant in West Virginia, that's where we got inevitably the the most reports of the Mothman, where the book came from and eventually the movie and everything like that. Um, yeah, it seems to be like maybe in one year you'll get this many reports and then it tapers off and then it makes a comeback. And um, like you said, you guys, you in the book, you had so many different reports of these winged humanoids and impossible Mothman sightings. So, I mean, I guess uh, my question for you would be, um, what patterns or connections, if there were any, were you able to make with, um, you know, what happened in Point Pleasant back in the day and what you guys were coming across in reports? Were they, are we dealing, I guess, Tobias, with the same creature or an offshoot of that or... Um, yeah, any patterns or connections you made between the Mothman of yesteryear and today? Sure. Um, you know, I would say that the phenomenon, whatever it is, it is likely the same. Now, I think what people need to understand about the uh, the, the Lake Michigan Mothman sightings is um, as a result of our investigation, like we were really able to create uh, two separate profiles of, of uh, sighting types, really. So the, the first one is likely um, uh, misidentified large uh, birds. And I, look, I, nobody likes to hear that. I don't like to hear it. It's, it's not fun, but it is part of doing our due diligence as 
uh, uh, in, investigators of these phenomena. Like if we come across evidence that that something like that exists, then then we have to to report that. And so um, what I, I noticed was uh, there were these daytime sightings where people would describe something large that they didn't recognize flying, usually at some distance. The sightings didn't last all that long. And, and they weren't accompanied by any kind of paranormal phenomena um, that is, is, is relatively common in the other sighting reports. Uh, and then in the spring of 2018, we received a, a sighting from a, uh, a man in the Pilsen neighborhood of Chicago. And he had a, a video. So he was bicycling to work and uh, he noticed this man and woman standing on a street corner um, pointing at something that was in the air. And, uh, and he looks up and he sees what he later described to me as um, either a large bat or a man in a wingsuit. And so he's got this GoPro camera on his bike helmet and he decides he's going to follow this thing around and get as much footage as he can, which I mean is amazing. And I wish everybody did that. And, uh, and so he did, he got a lot of good footage of it. I mean, it's, 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 it's a GoPro camera. So, you know, it's not, uh, uh, the, the resolution isn't amazing or anything, but it's, it's darn good enough. And, uh, and he was very forthcoming with, with that evidence and, uh, he was willing to send it to us. Um, he even sent us the, uh, original SD card that, uh, the, the, the footage was on. And so I don't think for a second that, that this guy was, was lying to me. I, I really, really don't. I think he saw something that was anomalous to him and, uh, and, and that um, he, uh, he understandably uh, mis misinterpreted because what we found after examining this video and, uh, and getting some good stills of the, the object that he had seen and blowing them up is it was definitely a bird. Uh, the silhouette to me uh, looked like probably a, a, a great blue heron. Um, they they do live in that area. You know, they, they migrate through every year. Um, and something people don't understand uh, about herons in that area is that due to climate change and the, the destruction of their wetland habitat is there are more of these birds uh, roosting in urban areas. And they're coming up north earlier, staying longer, sometimes overwintering. Um, and so I think that part of what we were dealing with was people seeing these birds who weren't really used to seeing them. Um, and so they in interpreted it as, as something weird. And if they went at that time and Googled like, you know, flying monster Chicago uh, or something, then they're going to get all of these, these winged humanoid sightings. They're going to, they're going to think, well, Hey, maybe, maybe that's what I saw. Cause I don't know what the hell it was otherwise. And so that's that first profile. However, those, by my estimation, account for maybe 40%, uh, 45 at the, the, the most of all of the sightings received. Um, and so that really, I, I, I think, forces us to examine then the, the other profile, which was uh, very strange uh, and certainly had a lot of aspects of the, the paranormal involved. And so what those people were describing, uh, if, if you take their testimony at its, its word, really, and my personal approach to investigation is to always proceed as though whatever the witness is telling me is true, unless I have direct evidence to the contrary. So of course I follow up on all of the details provided, check geographic and weather info, all of that stuff to make sure that their story adds up. And, and if and when it does, then I'm going to proceed as though the rest of what they're telling me is what actually happened, or at least was their experience. And so in those sightings, often what, what you would have people report is relatively close contact with uh, something that they said stood between seven and eight feet tall, uh, would have these, these large wings. Um, you know, they would uh, sort of alternately describe it using, you know, either bat-like or bird-like descriptors. Um, often they would report, you know, these glowing red eyes, uh, they would talk about feeling this overwhelming sense of fear or a palpable sense of evil. Some people would say that they thought that the eyes were sort of like staring through them or into their soul or they were hypnotized by them. And so a lot of really, really weird stuff and also uh, sort of, of, of happening alongside those really weird reports 
is you would get uh, reports of UFOs uh, often by the, the the same witnesses, certainly in the, the same area. I mean, everywhere around Lake Michigan has a lot of UFO sightings. So, I mean, there's a correlation there, but uh, you know, we all know correlation that doesn't necessarily mean causation, uh, but it's weird. And it's the same kind of weird that was happening in Point Pleasant back in the, the the 60s, you know, 66 to 67. And and frankly, never really stopped. Now you can talk now, you, you know, like you, you've had Seth on before and uh, you can talk to him and, and uh, it, you know, he's talked to people in the uh, uh, Ohio River Valley who are still investigating these sightings because really the Mothman sightings there never actually stopped. Right. right. Um, you know, the, the, the Silver Bridge collapse, um, in my opinion, was a, a convenient narrative ending to the, the Mothman prophecies, but probably totally unrelated to winged humanoid sightings in, in that area because, again, they never stopped. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there, there's a lot of commonalities there in what people are reporting. So, you know, honestly, I, I held off referring to this as the, the, the Lake Michigan Mothman for like at least a year because I didn't want to sensational, uh, uh, sensationalize anything. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, if, if I just slap the Mothman label on it right away, then, you know, that's, uh, that's, it's not, it's not good journalism. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's just sensationalistic. So I, I, I used clunky terminology, like uh, terminology, like flying humanoid winged humanoid uh, for forever until finally um, it, it was too much to ignore. And I thought, well, look, the best way to contextualize this for, for people is going to be to compare it to the thing that it has the most in common with. And, and right now and continuing, that is the, the Mothman of Point Pleasant sightings. So here we are, you know, uh, four years later with the, the uh, Lake Michigan Mothman. Interesting. And I love that, man. Cause again, yeah, like we don't know if it's the same creature or, uh, uh, or even the same, you know, phenomenon, but at the same time, the commonalities you're finding in the witness reports and even, um, like you said, how they're describing these feelings of dread or, or, or doom, or when they are looking into the eyes of these creatures, like that's so reminiscent of what they were reporting back during the Mothman days with Point Pleasant and the Silver Bridge collapse and, and all that. So I love that. Yeah. And I also really respect that um, you are willing to say a lot of this can be explained by natural causes or, you know, in terms of now e-natural causes of uh, climate change being the reason that people are seeing birds they've never seen before in that area at that time. That makes perfect sense that you your brain would not be used to seeing that and you would think it was something out of the ordinary. So no, I highly respect the way that you, you approach this and that you were willing to wait until the evidence was there to say, yeah, I think we might be dealing with, with a Mothman phenomenon. Um, well, I got to ask you, uh, a lot of people took notice of the work that you did with the Lake Michigan Mothman, including Josh Gates and his team over at uh, Expedition X and uh, you were featured on the show with your research. So I got to ask, what was that experience like, you know, getting into the world of TV? I know it all too well when it comes to these topics. <laughs> and sometimes it's, uh, it's not what you hope for or what you expect, sure. but um, what was the experience like working with, um, with the cast and crew over there? And how do you think they handled the, uh, the Mothman of Lake Michigan mystery? Sure. Uh, you know, honestly, overall, it was a very, very positive e experience. Um, I had a lot of fun. Uh, Phil and Jessica were were both great. Um, the the only thing for me was, uh, you know, standing next to them, I was just like, I'm not attractive enough to be here, guys. I, I I'm I'm sorry for this, you know. Um, but uh, they were great. They were a, a, a lot of fun. Um, the the entire crew was fantastic. The director. Uh, producers, uh, you know, ev everybody from the mic and, and, and camera guys, you know, like all, all just great. And actually it was interesting uh, sort of between filming, I got to talk to, to some of the, the crew more and, uh, and they had weird stories from other shoots they, they had been on, you know, like there's a guy telling me about um, seeing the, this weird ghost march in Hawaii when, when, when they were filming there. So like that, that was great. I was like, obviously these are my people. Um, so 
you know, this is this is a, a, a lot of fun. Um, and so, you know, uh, like I said, overall, that was that was fantastic. You know, we, we shot it in the Sears Tower or Willis Tower, if if one must. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like that was great. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, we were up on the, the, the observation floor. And so, like, we had an amazing view of the, the city the entire time, which I, I, I love. I mean, Chicago's a it's a great city. And so, um, yeah, that was that was all great. And then, you know, I, I watched the episode later and, you know, honestly, I don't know about anybody else, but I Emily had to make me watch it because I don't like watching myself in things. Right. And so I was like, you just watch it and you tell me if it's good or not and like how it all worked out. And she was like, no, 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 you you got to watch it. We'll just watch it. Yeah. And so I I, I did. And uh, and I thought that it, it, it was well done because. I understand. I mean, I, they sort of landed on um, the the bird hypothesis, and I think it expanded that sort of to most of the sightings, which I, I I think is understandable, considering that the show itself has to deal with what is provable right now. And I, I think that what is absolutely provable right now is that some of the sightings were of large birds, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I, I had I directed, well, one of the, the witnesses that was on there, um, the, like that, that, uh, video footage, that's the, the Pilsen, uh, uh, video footage. Like that's, okay. that's the same, okay. you know, that's the guy that I was just talking about. And so it's, I think it was perfectly understandable for them, uh, sort of with their, um, you know, material science based, uh, 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 slant, you know, like they're, they're like that direction for them to land on. Well, here's what we know. Uh, we know some people are mistaking birds for something else. And so we don't really know anything else beyond that. So that's all we can say for, for sure. Which again, like that's, that's fair. If you're trying to fit this mystery into like an hour long episode, right? Because there's only so much you can do there. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I think it's important too, that like we live in an age now where these shows are endless, you know, that you even have discovery plus where that's strictly what they're going to be is paranormal um, mysteries, stuff like that. So the more and more of this stuff that gets out there, uh, the more saturated the topics become, you know, some in a good way, some maybe not so much, but what I'm seeing changing Tobias, maybe you, you agree or disagree, uh, is they're willing to try to find an explanation more. And I think that's where Expedition X uh, actually does some good work. Like they're putting the science behind what they're doing. They're not coming out and saying, yeah, yeah, totally. It's Mothman. Like, no, let's, let's actually show what a proper investigation looks like and let's try to find an explanation. And I'm noticing that a lot more of the shows are willing to do that now. And um, not debunk, but try to explain uh, what is happening. Uh, will it account for everything? Certainly never, never. It never will. Like you said, like even in these waves of things, uh, even if they die down, they're still happening somewhere and to certain people. So, uh, yeah, I think I see that changing where shows like Expedition X were willing to say yes. Um, like you, even you mentioned like that 40%, I'm able to check the box off and say, this was a bird or, or something of that sort. Or even I remember the episode them saying it might've been a, a guy in, you know, bat wings and a jet pack going out there and flying <laughs> around the, the, the city. And that, you know, as funny as that is, look, we're seeing jet pack dude all over the place in Los Angeles right now. So right. who's to say that's not what's happening. So yeah, I, I, I'm glad to see that um, shows are willing to do that and to reach out to people like you instead of just, you know, hypothesizing and not going to the people who actually put the time and work in to investigate these things. No, I, I completely agree. You know, and I, I almost forgot like that, that wingsuit hypothesis was covered. And, you know, I, I had dismissed it very early, uh, well, you know, because working with with Lon and, and, and Manuel, like, you know, People had already spoken to to wingsuit experts who were like, "Oh, dude, you would die. There's no way that you can you can't do it. You can't jump off like the the Sears Tower in a wingsuit and not die. You would right. be dead." So yeah, I mean, and, and they of course came to the exact same conclusion 
uh, which any reasonable person would. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think from that that scientific viewpoint, like they they did everything that they they could, you know, and and, you know, like the 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 weird stuff, um, you know, like they they were able to, to entertain it. And I, I think that Jessica was more open to that than, than necessarily, you know, Phil, who's a big naturalist. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, like, they don't dismiss it entirely. I think just at the end of the episode, they're like, hey, this is this is what we can prove. This is what we can't prove. So here you go. Which, Take it for know. what it is. Yep. Right. Hey, guys, Ryan Spreck here. When I'm not making podcasts, I am listening to them. Seriously, I'm obsessed. And if there's one person and one show I turn to every week to hear stories of the strange, the weird, and the unexplained, it's of course got to be Jim Harold's Campfire. With over 500 episodes, Den of Geek called Jim Harold's Campfire the best tool we have currently in existence to hear real-life scary stories from other human beings since the actual campfire was invented. The concept is pretty simple. Jim talks to other regular folks and strange stuff that's happened to them. And yes, that includes UFOs and UAPs, along with cryptids, ghosts, and true head-scratching mysteries. One of my all-time favorite stories is one where a woman almost ended up being absorbed by a painting in a mysterious bar that seemed like something straight out of the Twilight Zone. Or there's the story of a young man who encountered a spider-like creature with baby hands. Then there's the story of a woman in England who encountered what she thought was a banshee only to suffer a horrible tragedy only moments later. Now, not all of the stories in Jim Harold's campfire are horrifying. Some are actually pretty heartwarming, like a visit from a past loved one or a peaceful near-death experience. Regardless, there are true and fascinating stories told by ordinary people who've had extraordinary experiences. So, pull up a virtual log Get cozy and tune in to Jim Harold's Campfire. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Somewhere in the Skies. All right, so we are moving from Mothman, Tobias, to your next endeavor, which might include Mothman, might not. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but this is Strange Tales of the Impossible, your new book. That just came out. So, um, what what was the impetus for this one? What you know, for me, I know when I write one book, there's so much left over that didn't make it in that I'm like, I could write a whole other book. And I I, I noticed that a lot of kind of the the correlations you made in the Mothman book were now bleeding over into your other work as well, which is the sign of a good investigator. So, yeah, tell us how um, Strange Tales came to be. Sure. So uh, unlike the the Lake Michigan Mothman, which was really meant to be a, a reference work so people could have all of the sightings and everything that it went into investigating them all in one place, uh, Strange Tales of the Impossible was meant to uh, sort of describe the experience of, of us investigating everything else that was happening concurrently, frankly. So like we weren't just investigating like Lake Michigan Mothman, you know, through to, uh, 2017 and, and on, you know, we've had all these other weird reports coming in too. And what I wanted to do was get all of those together in, in one place. And then, um, you know, in the, the 40 and cents, try to see what, if anything, they, they had in common and, uh, and, and what we could sort of speculate about and, uh, and, and maybe uh, learn about, you know, and so it did have a lot or does have a lot in common with the the Lake Michigan Mothman uh, in investigation and and book because you know that's some of the the same findings that uh, uh, came as a result of that particular investigation was noticing all of the weird commonalities you know all of the 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 strange concurrent paranormal phenomena happening uh, either to the same individuals or in the the, the same area. And then we took it a little further because when you when you really get down to it, 
and this is something that that uh, that's covered in uh, Strange Tales is across the board in, in in sort of every aspect of the paranormal, you have um, all of these these really really obvious uh, or or stark similarities to the point where if you kind of strip everything down to just its 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 basic you know sort of framework. It, they sound exactly the same. I can give you an example there. So I, I started out uh, talking about nighttime visitation, you know, because of course that's something that's that's very uh, very personal to me. And what I found was interesting after speaking to people, you know, who had grown up in haunted houses, people who said that they had experienced uh, alien abduction. Um, you know, people who had, uh, well, experienced even, even weirder stuff, you know, visiting them in the night. If you kind of just took out the description of the, the creature itself, these stories were basically all the same. You know, what, what you would find is somebody waking up in bed, um, able to move, you know, so, so sleep paralysis isn't really a, a, a factor here. So, you know, uh, they're, they're ambulatory and they see this weird thing, whatever it is, maybe it looks like an alien, maybe it looks like a ghost, maybe it looks like a, uh, an amber orb inside of a, a solid charcoal cloud, which is a real report that, that, that we had. Um, but the point is they, they wake up, uh, they are sure they're awake and they interact with this, this weird thing, what, whatever it is. And, um, you know, they, they kind of all had that basic story structure, like in, in common, which I, I found very, very interesting. And I sort of thought to myself, well, why aren't more people talking about this? Because it kind of seems like a, a big deal to me. Um, and so that's that's what we get into, and uh, and and there are other commonalities, uh, like I said, of of place and time and things that uh, that that also exist. But like that was a, a big one for me that that really stuck uh, uh, stuck out was the the similarities in these nighttime visitations. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I I kind of I, I love that idea of kind of taking the the focal point you know, the, the alien or the ghost out of the equation and seeing that the experiences still line up together, like run parallel to one another of how the, you know, the after effects are or the, you know, the mental toll it takes on you or the psychological or emotional uh, experience. Uh, that's really interesting, the correlations. Um, well, let's talk about Bet, if you don't mind. This is one of the first stories in in the book that really stuck out to me um primarily because uh we should add also in this book uh your wife does uh photography and there's also illustrations throughout as well to help enhance the stories and to also you know give you an idea of what these people actually saw when kind of you know language or words can't define it um and man that that creature that bet saw really stood out to me um not something i want to run into so yeah could you tell us a little about the story of bet if you don't mind sure yeah ab absolutely so you know i first spoke with bet this would have been what back in 2019 and uh I, she had become aware of some of the work that we'd done on, on winged humanoids and, uh, and she wanted to, to share her story. And so her experiences, as she recounted them to me, began in 1981 when she was just 13. She told me that uh, she remembered waking up to her room being filled with this, this strange light. And at that time, her first thought was, uh, this is in, in North Carolina, she thought, hey, the the mountains on fire so they they live by the, you know these mountains and she's like well there's got to be you know a huge fire engulfing the entire uh, mountain and she runs to her window to see what's going on and uh, she sees this weird craft and and she becomes paralyzed and uh, and she said for days after that uh she experienced um the this weird sickness like you know a, a very high high body uh temperature and and, and she just just did not feel well um and it wasn't too long after that, she said that she was reading in, in bed one night and uh, she saw this weird figure walk past her door. She notices the shadow of, of somebody walking past her door. And then she uh, said that she saw the head of this weird uh, bird-like humanoid thing, uh, you know, sort of peek around 
her door frame uh, and and look at her for you know several seconds, and then uh, duck around and 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 disappear. Um, and so again, what's what's interesting about those is uh, now this is a, a a UFO story, you know, and if you were a, a ufologist or something, you would look at this uh, strictly in terms of of UFOs. But again, this this theme of people waking up to weird lights in their room, to you know, being in bed and having creatures uh, observing them. I mean, it is across the board in, from every. Uh, 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 reported phenomena from uh, Bigfoot to Mothman to, to UFOs uh, to, to ghosts. It's, it's, it happens in, in every aspect. So now five years later, she had what would become the most impactful I experience out of her series of encounters. Now, um, as she uh, related to me, she was on her way to visit her uh, sister, and, uh, you know, her sister lived about 20 minutes away from her. And I believe it was about 8 p.m. in, I want to say, February. So, you know, it was already basically dark at, at that point. Um, and so she is driving to her sister's and she pulls up. Now, this is a very rural area. And so she pulls up to this uh, T intersection. And... Um, she uh, she sees as she comes up to this this stop sign that um, there is this uh, impossible creature uh, in her headlights standing uh, next to this barn that is uh, just briefly illuminated before she can she can turn and so she sees this thing that she describes as sort of this bird like human. Um, and it's 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 dressed. She said that she noticed uh, in particular that it was wearing these combat boots, and um, and and she's terrified. So she gets the hell out of there. Uh, you know, she turns and she takes off, and and she goes about as fast as she can. Now, again, these are winding country roads, so she can go maybe 45, 50 miles per hour without ending up in the uh, ditch. Uh, and after she takes off, she looks in her rearview mirror and she sees this thing following her. It had taken to the air, and it's it's coming after her. And so, of course, like terrified, like she's doing her best to get away and it's to no avail. This thing catches up and she says that it starts you know, beating on her car and scratching on the, the, the driver's side as though it's trying to get in. And, uh, and and she's absolutely terrified while this this is happening. And the next thing she knows, it's midnight and she's nowhere near her her destination with no idea how how she got there. She said that she had basically just come to uh, still driving and uh, and had no idea, um, you know, how she had gotten to, to where she was. And so she figured out where, where she was. She wasn't that far uh, from from home. And, and so she just went home. And of course, her sister was was terrified. Um, and so, you know, she had just kind of explained what happened. And she said that, um, you know, she had noticed some some damage to her car. Uh, she had a picture of her car. She didn't have a picture of the damage, uh, unfortunately. And and I've, I've seen that um, more than once, which, you know, these older cases, I don't know. I didn't own a camera in 1986. Uh, so um, it just kind of is is what it is. But, you know, in, in speaking to her, you know, she certainly seemed like somebody who, uh, well, she didn't have, have anything to gain. I, I can tell you that. Um, it, like everybody, you know, she... She had something to lose by having a, a story like this out there, but she very bravely was willing to uh, attach her name to it. And, and she actually provided that sketch of the, the creature. That was her, like that, 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 that was Bet's uh, sketch, you know? Oh, so, know. and, you know, she sent us a, a, a picture of her, her car and everything. Um, and so, you know, like I said before, um, I, you know, if, if I can verify the details of, of somebody's story, at least as well as I can, which I was able to with her and she was willing to go on the record and everything else, then I'm going to proceed as though, you know, the, the, the testimony uh, uh, reflects uh, the witness's authentic experience because what choice do I have really? Um, I think at, at the end of the day, uh, there's a humanitarian aspect where we have to remember. And I think this is very easy for some people to forget that there are human beings behind every single one of these stories. And right. Um, these are very personal, very impactful, sometimes traumatic. 
Um, and, uh, and they deserve to be taken seriously. Uh, they don't deserve to be interrogated um, or, or, or certainly not mocked or, or anything else. And so, um, yeah, it was a, it was for as wild of a, a tale as it is, you know, it, it was convincing uh, based solely on, you know, my experiences speaking with, with that um, and, uh, and how level-headed and, um, and, and, and credible that, that yeah. she seemed. So, and then, you know, uh, again, just seeing the, the commonalities in, in her experiences with the experiences of so many other people. And of course they don't know each other and there hasn't really been any uh, promoted like mainstream narrative for them to kind of to, you know, for, for them to kind of take this stuff from. So I, you know, I, I didn't really entertain the idea that they had all just been absorbing the, the same media or, or anything, because really um, like I said, the, the the commonalities exist within the that that exist within the uh, narrative aren't really uh, anything to do with the the, the details of the uh, phenomena so much as like how it it is interacting with them, um, which again just makes it seem more credible to to me. Yeah, well, and you touch on something too that I think uh, you you stress in the book is perception. Uh, is a big thing as well. And from what you just described to me of what Bet has experienced, um, a ufologist would think, whoa, that was like some sort of missing time experience. Maybe she was abducted. Um, maybe it was a screen memory. You know, I always go back to this story I'm told by a, a UFO researcher who's looked heavily into the connection between owls and alien abductions. And uh, the idea that a lot of the time an owl precedes or uh, a UFO event or a scene afterwards. And that maybe these are the form that an alien takes. So it's recognizable to the human observing it. And I was always like, yeah, that's really interesting. And he, t he told me this one story where uh, Mike Cleland is the name of the gentleman, uh, where a woman who had been abducted many times throughout her life, you know, she was washing the dishes one night and she looked out the window in the kitchen and she saw a gray alien walking towards her house. And she just was like, no, no, not tonight. I, I, you know, my kids need help with their homework. I've got too many chores, no abduction tonight, not happening. So she literally, you know, drops the plate in the sink, goes outside and confronts the alien. And when she gets up to it and she's like, no, no, the alien like froze and literally just went owl, 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 owl. It literally started saying owl in front of her as if it were supposed to take that form and that she wasn't supposed to see the alien. And as comical as that sounds, man, I was like, that makes perfect sense to me. Like it's something that you would recognize. It's something that, um, you know, if you were to tell someone, uh, I was abducted by a five foot owl in the middle of the night, you know, uh, near my house, like who's going to believe that. So I find it really interesting how much perception might have a lot to do with this and how bet may have perceived this experience, um, in the way she did, but who's to say that someone else who was put in her shoes wouldn't have taken something else from it. So I find that fascinating too, this whole idea of perception. And I kept coming across, that word in your book. Um, and I'm so happy you went there because I think that has a lot to do with this as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting that, that you bring up that particular story too, uh, because something else that, uh, that I had, had noticed was sort of this theme of interruption. You know, sometimes they're surprising us. Sometimes we're surprising them, yeah. um, which was always interesting. Like I, I spoke to a, a young woman in Janesville, Wisconsin, who had a very similar experience, only uh, she caught the thing that she described to me as a, a, a gray alien uh, uh, completely off guard one night after, well, I can just tell the the, the, the story real quick instead of, sure. kind of dancing around it because nobody will have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, go <laughs> ahead. <please. laughs> so she uh, she falls asleep on her, her couch one night, uh, wakes up to this bright light in her uh, living room and uh, and it's coming through their front door. And so uh, their front door, basically uh, it has uh, this small wall 
uh, that doesn't let you see the front door from the uh, living room. So in order to go get the door, you have to walk around this 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 wall, and then the the front door is right there. And so she she notices this light coming in from the the front there, and she's like, well, you know, maybe it's my roommate. I'll go see, make sure she has her keys since I'm up now anyway. And then as she's walking over, she's like, oh man, what if it's a burglar or something? And then she rounds this 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 you know small wall in in front of the the door, and she sees what she described to me as sort of your typical gray alien. Uh, you know, she said she stood, I think like five, five and this thing was shorter than her and it had the big black eyes and, and big head and everything. And, and this is where it got really interesting for me because she said that uh, when she sees this thing, um, like she was terrified and she screamed. And then interestingly enough, when she screams, the, the, the alien screamed. So like it, it surprises her. She surprises it. They both scream. And then she takes off running, and uh, and and from there she had sort of a uh, not typical uh, abduction experience. But there, you know, there are other things that that you know you you would have seen or or heard uh, sort of in uh, 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 sort of just similar to, to other uh, uh, abduction experiences where she's struck by this beam of light that that causes her to sort of float backwards, and then um, you know next thing she knows she's being lowered down and and sort of just. Uh, free and and awake on her couch as though nothing had happened. But uh, it just reminded me of that, you know, like sometimes mm -hmm. apparently um, we just, we catch each other off guard and then, uh, and then everybody screams. So who knows? <laughs> but, um, uh, that is just an awkward with, uh, party for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> nobody's having fun at that party. Yeah. No, no thanks. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, with the matters of, of perception, uh, yeah, I think that from what I have seen, um, there seems to be some element of this sort of really directly linked to, to consciousness. And, and so I don't know if that represents uh, sort of consciousness as a, a medium of, of communication, you know, like they're, that's sort of how whatever we're dealing with uh, uh, communicates with us. And so there's there's a, a direct manipulation where it can just appear ho however it wants uh, or, or how that all works. But it, it certainly seems to be consistent um, across phenomena, especially when you start to look at the accompanying uh, phenomena, you know, and, and how similar that is, you know, like we'll have uh, a winged humanoid um, uh, witness who might experience poltergeist phenomena uh, after their sighting. That's very similar to poltergeist uh, uh, phenomena that's reported by somebody who lives in a reportedly haunted house. Or, um, you know, you'll you'll have people, uh, well, reporting like glowing red eyes. Like, why does every cryptid have glowing red eyes? I mean, it's it's reported from seriously from Bigfoot to, to Mothman yeah. uh, to, to Dogman. Yeah. Like people report these, these glowing red eyes and from a, a purely uh, I think uh, biological uh, perspective, they don't make any sense because one, one thing I'll do is I want to, I want to see if, if somebody reports glowing eyes uh, you want to examine whether or not that's eye shine. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if I ask somebody that and they're telling me that there really was no light source that that could have been causing this this eye shine um, and its eyes were glowing anyway. Well, that doesn't make any sense from a biological perspective, because uh, I would think that the easiest way to go blind would be to have your eyes glow because you're not going to be able to see anything but just red, you know, once once that's happening. So um, it's just interesting to me, you know, like you see all of this. This 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 stuff, these weird commonalities uh, in in these experiences, and it does make you wonder, um, what do they have? You know, what 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 else do they have in common? Is is there a common source? Is there just a a related source? You know, one of the things that I like to speculate about, because frankly, uh, the idea that all of this weirdness comes from the exact same source, you know, as though it's it's one. Uh, entity or or intelligence or you know even just one uh, uh, like homogenous uh, group of entities just me like messing with us like that's not terribly popular and I get that because it does seem a little um, reductionist you know in, in in terms of people's experiences you know because they 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 do have some stuff that's that's not in common 
like at at all. So, right. You know, that being the case, you know, I have to wonder if there isn't just some set of, of related phenomena, you know, so sort of in the same way that, uh, you know, you've got uh, bears and wolves and they both live in, in this forest. That doesn't mean that a bear is a wolf or a wolf is a bear. They're just both, uh, you know, mammals with a lot of common characteristics, but still unique individual species that happen to occupy the same territory. So sort of in that same vein, what if what we're dealing with is sort of this invisible uh, universe of, of beings that sort of all exist uh, in, in a form that uh, has to interact with us directly through, through consciousness. And if you want to get really weird, then you can start examining ideas like, okay, well, our ancestors used to, to uh, allow for the, the possibility, or at least one popular explanation for fairies with that was that they were the souls of the dead. Well, what if human consciousness does survive uh, a bodily death and it's able to take whatever weird form it wants? What if people, when they die, can become fairies? What if they can become greys or mothman or, or anything else? You know, what if our consciousnesses are part of this sort of ecology uh, or, or, or ecosystem of, of consciousness um, and, uh, and we don't really experience it, at least not fully, unless we are either in like an altered state of, of consciousness or, or dead, honestly. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, then it gets really, really weird. So uh, these, I mean, these are the kinds of things that I, I, I like to speculate about. And, and certainly, you know, I, I talk about that in the, the, the book, Strange Tales. Yeah. Uh, and look, man, so, yeah. I was going to say, everything's on the table. You know, I mean, we don't have the answer, so why not go there? Why not go as far out as we can and then rein ourselves in? And I think, you know, like you said, the, this whole idea of consciousness and, um, you know, things being related uh, is very prevalent. And I, I was actually surprised to see how much you did cover UFOs in, in Strange Tales. And um, one of the places you brought up is very well known to the, us in the UFO field, and that's uh, Chicago O'Hare Airport. Um, when I say that, I know what everyone's thinking in my audience. 2006, disc over the airport, uh, UFO event. But um, mm -hmm. lo and behold, you dug up this report that came to you of not a UFO, but something completely different. So would you mind maybe telling us a little about, um, yeah, yeah, what you came across when it came to... Uh, winged humanoids over at Chicago Air Airport? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, since, boy, I want to say December of 2019, probably, is when people started reporting uh, weird winged humanoids, like, yeah, in and around Chicago O'Hare. Um, and, uh, and, I mean, anybody familiar with that area knows that it is a huge, sprawling airport. It is it's the, the, the airport campus is, is enormous. And so um, most of the uh, reports were, you know, at, at, at least at first sort of coming from the, the cargo area and that's sort of a more isolated area. And there are some, some large fields and, and, and stuff surrounding those. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of set apart from everything else. And so like my, uh, personal in introduction to that. Now, I mean, most of these uh, reports uh, started coming into uh, to Manuel and and then Lon, and then I had somebody reach out to us directly, and I, I spoke to this man who uh, was a, a, a cargo em employee um, with with one of the, the major airlines there, and uh, and he told me about how he had left work one night and he was going to meet his friend for a, a, a drink, which again. Like this is a, another really common aspect of these sightings, uh, which is people just on their way to do normal people stuff all the time. You know, whether it's running out to you know grab a gallon of milk, going to to meet a, a a friend for a drink, maybe you're out to dinner with your significant other, whatever. Uh, but just out, you know, doing things that we all do all the time when you know they run into these impossible experiences so that's what happened to him he was uh he was heading out from work to to meet his friend for a drink and he was driving past 
this uh, there's this large, like I said, open field area. Um, and it's bordered by this like eight foot tall fence. Like I've been there and I checked it out and, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, really it is this large grassy area uh, with this, this big fence in front of it. And, you, and you'll get wildlife in there, like deer and stuff find their way in. Um, and so uh, he's driving past it and, uh, and he notices this, what he described is like a seven or eight foot tall uh, black uh, winged being standing there uh, with these glowing red eyes. And um, he was one of those people who reported this intense feeling of fear um, and, and this feeling of, of evil for lack of a, a, a better word, you know, and what's interesting about speaking with him too is, uh, you know, it was very um, uh, down to earth, you know, uh, uh, sounding gentleman. Like I, I spoke to him for some time and, uh, and like a lot of people do, I mean, he doubted his sanity at first. Um, and, uh, because look, I mean, we've all heard of Mothman and we all think that it's, it's really, really interesting and, uh, and, and super cool. But look, most people have no idea who Mothman is. They don't know about any of this stuff. They've never heard of it. And so when they see something like that, they don't know what the hell to do. And, uh, and they think that they're losing their minds until they manage to, you know, get online and look into it and, and find somebody like, like, you know, me or, or Lon or, or Manuel or, or, you know, whoever else. Um, and that was this guy. And, uh, and so, it seemed again, you know, very, very credible, at, at least in terms of being able to, you know, verify the the verifiable details of, of his story. You know, I, I like I said, I, I did go down there and uh, and check out that area, um, and everything was was right where he said it was. And, and what was interesting uh, to me was, again, you know, like my only experience with O'Hare had been, you know, flying into and and, and out of it. Like I'm relatively familiar with the area, but you know, I'd never really spent a lot of time hanging out around it or driving around it. And it really is huge. And there really are some, some very large sort of natural areas in there. Uh, it's not, you know, heavily forested or, or anything like that. But, you know, like I said, there are some big, big open areas uh, that are relatively isolated. And so the idea that somebody could have a sighting like that uh, in in that area um, and have it be relatively isolated, um, it, it seems possible, you know, uh, just just from uh, e examining it, you know, because I think a lot of people hear O'Hare and they think, well, you know, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people going through there on a, a daily basis. Um, you know, how could they all you know, be, be missing it. Well, I, again, like my experience of going through uh, uh, O'Hare up until when I went down there to, to actually check it out was, you know, being inside of a giant airport and you would have no idea if there's a Mothman out on, <laughs> on a field by the cargo area or something. Like, how would you know? You can't see it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, plus your mind is yeah. like, you're so overstimulated when you're in an airport to begin with. Like the last thing on your mind is looking out the window for a cryptid or even a UFO. Like where's my plane and am I going to make it to my terminal is the first thing on your mind. Right. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of, of course, you know, so um, yeah. You know, and, and, and the, the reports kept coming in. Uh, especially, like I said, from around that that cargo area. Now there have been some other reports that uh, were made by people who claimed to be like pilots and 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 see this winged humanoid on the the tarmac and stuff. Um, now those I those can be a little problematic in that you know even with the the witness contact information, I really wasn't able personally to to uh, verify like the, the witnesses uh, identity. So, you know, I, I will definitely stop short of saying that, that they are hoaxes because I don't have any evidence for that. And one of my biggest pet peeves are people who label everything that could potentially be a hoax as a hoax without evidence of it actually being one, because I find that to be as disingenuous 
as somebody who labels uh, everything as being paranormal without any any actual evidence of it being paranormal. If you don't know what it is, or you you know like you don't have enough information to make a determination, the only honest thing you can do is say that. And yep. so when it comes to the the like. Um, uh, supposed like pilot sightings and stuff. I don't have enough information about those to say one way or the other, but I, I can say that, you know, I, I did reach out to, to those witnesses and I was unable to, uh, to uh, verify their identity because they kind of clammed up after I, I, I asked for that. So, um, you know, whether or not that represents uh, somebody just spinning a, a tall tale or, if it's somebody who just doesn't trust a total stranger over the internet uh, with information that could cost them their career, uh, you know, that's for you to decide. But, um, yeah. but the, you know, the, the, the other cases, like when you talk about the people working in, in, in the cargo areas and, and truckers and stuff like that, they were, I think a lot less reluctant to, to really get into it and get speak on the telephone and sort of verify all of these details and stuff. Um, you know, because I, you know, I, I feel like they, much like a lot of people, I felt like they didn't want their name, like full name necessarily attached to these stories because of the, the social stigma. But I don't think that they had the same fear of tanking like their entire career that, that you could possibly see uh, uh, amongst, you know, like a professional airline pilot or, or something similar. Yeah, so, that, but, that's a know, good point. I uh, I was just going to say, Tobias, the only real uh, witness that we have that has come forward from the Chicago O'Hare uh, UFO incident was the same, was a cargo uh, person as well. So I think you're right. I think there's, you know, not to take anything away from probably the really hard work that they do every day at the airport. But, yeah, they're not flying uh, a 747. They're not, you know, uh, risking their flight. Um, you know, their flight career uh, on this. So they might be a little more apt to be like, I saw something weird and I want to talk about it. So yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and so there's, there's really been all manner of, of, of high strangeness that's, that sort of come out of that area since. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think that this just started happening, frankly, because the, the longer that this investigation goes on, um, the more historical cases that we tend to get. Because, again, most people have never heard of the Mothman. They don't know who John Keel is. They've never heard of Point Pleasant. They don't know who I am. Like, they, like most normal people don't know about any of this stuff. And so what we would see is... Um, like an article that maybe I had written or something uh, get, uh, gets a lot of popularity online and, you know, it gets, you know, five, 600,000 views or something. And so it just finds its way to this person who's been sitting on a story for like 30 or 40 years sometimes. And they go, wow, holy crap. I had no idea that anybody had ever seen something even similar to this experience I, I had, you know, way back when. Um, and so now, you know, they're, they are uh, uh, actually sort of um, comfortable, I think, uh, sharing it. Cause I mean, where else would you go? You know, people don't call <laughs> the police for this stuff. Um, it's just, right. I, you know, I, I don't think people have called the, the, the police to report this stuff since like sometime in the late eighties, early nineties. It's just, it stopped being a, a, a thing. I think especially the more these events got into the, the popular consciousness, like it, it, it's not real tough for people to look, like especially beginning in sort of like the 70s. It wasn't real hard for people to look what media, at, look at what media coverage was doing to people's lives and the kind of circus they would become. And it never helped. And the police were never able to do anything or help anybody with this stuff in any way. Um, and so I think at a certain point, people just kind of decided, you know, hey, um, this isn't worth it. You know? It's not worth like, it. Oh, that's wow. Yeah, I never really thought about that. Yeah, you, you would see a lot of early UFO sighting reports or I'm sure uh, cryptids as well going to law enforcement because like you said, where else would you turn? And you didn't have, you know, kind of this ingrained uh, 
ridicule factor within the mainstream media on how to handle these topics. And we know that's why Project Blue Book existed here in the UFO world and why they told all these news stations and newspapers to downplay it and to, um, you know, say they're kooks and crazy and tinfoil hat wearing and um, let it, you know, let it feed itself in terms of that. Um, when you're right, back then it was like, I honestly saw this. I don't know what else to do. I'm going to give it to the police or I'm going to give it to the local news station. Um, yeah, I never really thought about how how the times have changed and how uh, that fear of reporting things has just been ingrained in people for so long. But I don't know if it's the same for you in the things you're looking into. But, uh, you know, ever since this 2017 New York Times article came out in um, on UFOs, uh, my my email is just exploding like never before, and more and more people are willing to come forward and talk about this stuff than ever before. Almost too much. Like I can't even keep up with correspondence anymore. So, um, yeah, I, I think I see things changing. I don't know if it's for the same the same for you when it comes to you know the humanoid sightings and everything you guys are doing. But yeah, do you think the tides are turning at all? Well, I, I think in, in terms of uh, eroding the stigma around things like UFO sightings, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and honestly, um, you know, uh, we have investigated a, a, a lot of, of winged humanoid sightings, but, you know, we get a lot of UFO sightings, too. Uh, we get a lot of people contacting us about ghosts and and, and other cryptids, uh, you know, Bigfoot and, and, and similar. So um, in terms of UFO sightings, I think that uh, I don't know that I've seen like an increase necessarily. It's I think that's always been a, a more popular one for people to, to reach out, you know, uh, uh, to us about. But at the same time, I, I do see what you're saying. And, and I do think that there has been an increase sort of across the board from from what I've seen uh, uh in people willing to come forward and, and actually speak of their experiences. You know, I mean, when you've got, um, you know, military pilots and, uh, and politicians and stuff who are willing to put their face on television, like publicly talking about like this subject, then I think uh, that does a lot uh, in terms of making just, you know, your, your average citizen a lot more comfortable in coming forward with their, their, their own experience, which of course is, is, is fantastic. You know, we're probably just starting to see the unraveling um, of a lot of the, the confusion and harm caused by those, those early air force programs, you know, designed to, to debunk and, and ridicule UFOs and, and unfortunately UFO witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. And things seem to be changing. And I hope that the rest of uh, the communities who investigate these things uh, will see a change as well. I think right now it really is the time of UFOs. And that's because it is in the mainstream media right now. And it's being legitimized and in, in by, by politicians, by the military. And uh, that's great. Um, my hope is that that will bleed over into the other communities that do look into the paranormal, that do look into cryptids. Um, hopefully we'll get there. I think, you know, a lot of people have asked me like, okay, the government is saying UFOs are real. That's a huge step. But what about the abductions? What about the close encounters? What about, um, you know, you, you've even had reports where uh, witnesses of UFO events have had phys physiological effects happen to them. Um, what about those people who've been burned by, you know, radiation from these UFOs as well? When will that become a part of the conversation? And I tell them, we'll get there. We're not there yet, but we'll get there. So my hope is that, yes, one day it starts with UFOs exist. At least that's what the U.S. government is saying. We forget there's a whole world out there as well with other governments who are looking into these things too. Um, but my hope is that one day we will get to, okay, where's our government program funding for Bigfoot? Like, let's go do that now, you know? Um, right now it's UFOs, but maybe in the future we'll get there. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, sure. Well, you know, honestly, they've all had their time. Um, you know, if you look at, at how Bigfoot was covered in, in, in the 70s, uh, you had a lot of, 
uh, you know, sort of credible scientists, you know, look like looking into that particular mystery. Um, you know, ghosts have certainly had had their heyday, uh, you know, beginning in the very early aughts with uh, the the uh, advent of, uh, you know, paranormal reality television. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I think that there are cycles uh, that, that, that we go through, like like anything, uh, you know, uh, this is the UFOs moment. Um, and, uh, and for everybody interested in, in UFOs, just enjoy it. And hopefully it'll, it'll last forever. Uh, traditionally these things do not, but yeah, you know, uh, this eventually, you know, like it has to start somewhere. So it might as well be here. And, uh, and, and hopefully, yeah, we can build on this and, and, and increase the, uh, momentum of, of interest in, in all, in all kinds of, of weirdness. And, there are still credible scientists that are interested in 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 Bigfoot. I I didn't mean to like imply that that, that there aren't. It didn't all end in, in the seventies or anything. Right. But, uh, but you know, in in terms of like, sort of like the the it paranormal phenomenon, you know, like there, it, it is it, it it is secular and, and and they sort of take turns. And so it's it's UFOs turns. Uh, it's it's the UFOs turn right now. And uh, quite deservedly so. And uh, and I, I hope you're right, Ryan. I, I hope that uh, that this does lead to uh, more mainstream interest in in these types of, of subjects. Because one of the, honestly, one of the things I've learned, if nothing else, is that there is no specific uh, type or socioeconomic class of person that experiences this stuff. It is across every strata of society and so you know like literally whatever people who aren't experiencers or haven't met experiencers are picturing in their head of, of who the the type of people are who who experience this stuff get rid of it because they could work in your office they could go to your church you would pass them at the grocery store or or anywhere else uh, walking down the street and you would look at them twice because they are your they are your friends, they are your neighbors, they are your loved ones. And so I would hope that that being the case, we would actually be able to do these these people that we should care about the the service of uh, of examining these uh, uh, experiences seriously. So you know if if that's what this leads to, all the better. I love that, man. Yeah, like I always tell people, these topics bring us together more than they they pull us apart. And in a world right now divided by so many different things in so many different ways, uh, I'm glad we can come together on one thing, and that's what the hell is going on in our skies, in our woods, in our oceans with all this weird weird stuff and you are one of those pioneers that's really going out and asking the uh the the more philosophical and harder questions of these phenomena you know not just it's not just a disc in the sky it's not just a um missing link creature in the middle of the woods it's probably a lot weirder than that and i i highly respect the work that you and emily are doing in in terms of that so Kind of to wrap things up with you. I know we're going a little over the time I, I told you we would. Um, so thank you for sticking with me, man. I appreciate it. Um, it's been yeah, a great conversation. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what what do you personally want out of all this? I love to know, you know, yeah, how you got involved. Um, but what has kept you going? And what do you want out of this journey you're on? You know, I always tell people for me. I don't think I'm ever going to get the answers to the UFO question. I saw one and I want to know what I mm. saw, but I don't know if I ever will. And a big part of me actually is okay with that. But I love to hear like, what, what do you hope for? Do you want to know what these winged humanoids are or uh, what UFOs represent or yeah. What do you want out of this journey you're taking in this lifetime? Sure. Well, I, I think we all sort of want those those answers, but you're you're probably right uh, in in terms of, of being realistic about it. You know, everybody's sort of after the the big D disclosure. Uh, you know, uh, experiencers large uh, largely are just looking for closure in you know uh, uh, in terms of of their own experiences. Um, but for me, honestly, uh, if I'm being 
realistic and 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 this is sort of my advice for for anyone who is interested in these subjects especially if you're interested in in investigating them uh learn to love the journey frankly uh learn to marvel at at the mystery of the universe and in our our tiny tiny place in it um because likely that that might be all you're going to get um don't be obsessed with this stuff. You can't. It's not worth it. Uh, have other hobbies. Start a family. Uh, volunteer in your community. You know, do anything else in your life too, because um, again, you, you know, we're very, very likely uh, to not necessarily have uh, uh, any, uh, certainly not all, of the answers we're we're looking for within our lifetimes. I mean, many, many people have come before us all sure that, you know, by the time their life was over, we would have these mysteries solved. And none of them so far have been correct. So you really have to find your joy in uh, experiencing the investigation and speaking with people and hearing their stories and then sort of speculating about what might be behind it. It's uh, it's it's almost um, analogous to, to religion in, in that way, in that I don't know that we have the technology necessary at this point to even properly study this stuff, which means until that happens, we're always going to be in a position of just having to observe it from afar, experience it under circumstances over which we have very little control, and uh, and and just uh, speculate. So learn to enjoy those aspects of it, and uh, I think you'll probably come out of this sane. Um, and that's uh, that's what I'm looking for. I love that. Yep, embrace the strange. It's just going to make your life a lot more interesting. And um, look, man, this has been an interesting conversation. I know we only scratched the surface of uh, both of your books, so I got to ask: Where can we find everything you and Emily are up to? And where can we find your books? And what comes next for you guys over there at the uh, Singular Fourteen Society? Sure. Well, if you're interested in finding out more about what we do, uh, you can go to our website at singular Uh, If you're interested enough in what we're doing that you want to be a part of it, then I encourage you to check us out at uh, patreon.com slash singular Now we have uh, tiers for any level of interest or involvement in high strangeness. So, you know, if you like this stuff, I, I would encourage you to, to take a look. Uh, as far as um, the Lake Michigan Mothman and uh, Strange Tales of the Impossible, they are both available for sale on Amazon. We do have signed copies available of the Lake Michigan Mothman through uh, our website right now. So singular 40 slash books. Uh, we are going on uh, a vacation from the 7th through the, the 14th. And so we will have signed copies of Strange Tales of the Impossible uh, in mid-August. So look for those also at singular40n.com slash books around then. Um, another great way to keep up with us is to follow us on social media. We are on every social media platform that you would expect a 41-year-old man to be on. So Facebook and Instagram and Tumblr and Twitter. We are on all of that stuff. Uh, so definitely check us out there. And, uh, you know, we've got more exciting stuff coming up. Uh, there's that uh, Salt Town Monsters uh, on the trail of the Lake Michigan Mothman documentary that's coming out later this year, I think. Um, you know, and we always have stuff that, that we're working on. Who knows what like, will be next, but um, I'm sure it'll be exciting. It always is, man. And to tease your Patreon, I want to let my listeners and viewers know that you and Emily actually did a CE5 experiment, which I'm really interested to hear how that went. So please go check out their Patreon as well to see how that all turned out. Um, but other than that, Tobias, I got to thank you for giving me your time today, man, and your insights. This has been very refreshing for someone who only talks about UFOs. 24 seven. So thank you so much for coming on somewhere in the skies today. Hey, thank you so much, Ryan. Like this, this was a blast. Uh, it was, it was my pleasure. <laughs>